Hello, I hope you've been doing well. When I first started out in the hobby, I had no idea what I was doing. Sometimes I do take the knowledge that I've gained over the past two years for granted. While I still fully believe that everyone can build their own custom keyboard if you want to. I also realized that there's a lot of things that are new, especially if you're figuring it out for the first time. I hope that this video will demystify at least a little bit of the keyboard building process and maybe even get you to think about building your own. Let's start with the PCB. Some PCBs come with edge rails or breakaway rails. They're not super common, but if you get a PCB with one attached, the easiest way of snapping them off is using a pair of chunky pliers and work from the edges in or from one edge to the other. It's actually quite satisfying to snap off once you get a good grip on the railing. Before you start your build, it's highly recommended to test your PCB in case your PCB has some issues. That way, you don't waste time building your board only to realize that it doesn't work. I like to use the website keyboardchecker.com. In order to test your PCB, you'll need something metal. Tweezers, switch puller, twist tie, anything that can pass an electrical signal. You touch your metal object to the two holes for each switch. If the switch doesn't light up, your PCB may not be flashed, or there might might be an issue with the connector or a missing component or even broken trace if you're using a pre-soldered PCB. If the switch does light up, then you're good to go. If you're building a board with a separate daughter board, then you'll have to connect your main PCB to your daughter board PCB with a JST connector. The connectors have a little ridge on the side so you can check if the ridge is closer to the flat top side or the bottom side with bits of exposed metal. Once you figure out the orientation, you align the connector with the socket and push the end firmly in to make sure the connector is fully seated. I've noticed that the flat top side typically faces outward and the bottom side sits against the PCB, but sometimes you have PCBs where the hole in the socket faces away or outwards, so by checking the ridges on the side of the connector, it's easy to tell the correct way to plug it in. In order to remove the connector, it's probably safest to use sharp tweezers to gently pry the connector out. There are some connectors where you can yank on the cable directly, but unless you've been told that you can do that by the designer, I wouldn't suggest it because you can possibly pull the wire out of the connector. On to switches. There are two main types of switch housing shapes and corresponding switch opener prongs to match. For cherry housings, you line up the small prongs like this. And for kale housings, you line up the big prongs like this. I actually really like my Wuchu Bear opener for cherry switches compared to the KBD fans opener I used for the longest time because the prongs on the bear opener are rounded which does a better job of popping off the top. Any switch opener should totally work. Using switch film is a really popular mod for JWK, Duroc switches, and linear switches. Switch films come in either a rectangular shape or a rectangle with an extra piece in the middle. If your switch film is a square shape, like thick films, you can pretty much just place onto the switch housing. For thick films, it's actually suggested to place the switch film onto the top housing since it's easier to manage that way. For all other films, I usually place the film onto the bottom housing. If you have a switch film with an extra piece in the middle, the bigger square goes where the stem of the switch goes, and you'll see that the extra piece lines up with the shape of the switch housing. I usually place my switch film after lubing the bottom housing and before placing the spring. Something I really struggled with when initially modding switches is figuring out how to put all the parts back together. Opening is generally pretty easy, reassembly… I definitely crushed a few switches in the beginning since I had no idea what I was doing. So once the spring is in, make sure that the legs of the stem is pointed towards the metal leaf of the bottom housing. The next important part is the top housing. Make sure that the big bump of the top housing where the logo is aligns with the metal leaf. The open housing sits over the leaf. If you do it the other way, then GG. Under the assumption that you'll be building a board with either 5-pin or 3-pin switches, here's how you tell how to align your switches. The big hole of the switch goes in the center of the switch footprint, and the metal parts from the leaves go into the shiny holes in the PCB. The extra pins of a 5-pin switch is used for a bit more stability. It's really important to make sure that both metal pins are protruding from the holes on the back side of the PCB when you flip it over. It's possible to have a switch pin become crushed when 
when inserting into the PCB. And if that happens, you can use a pair of tweezers and straighten out the legs. I've only run into this issue once, where the extra pins of a 5-pin switch were too big to fit into the PCB. If you ever encounter this, you may need to either clip the extra pins or squish them to fit into the PCB. For my build, I opted to go for the squish method so I could still have the pins kind of secure into the PCB. I used my pliers and elongated the pins to make them more narrow to be able to fit into the smaller holes. If you opt for the clip method, I would use wire cutters to cut off the extra pins. You can also do this to get 5 pin switches to fit into PCBs that only support 3 pin switches such as with some hot swap PCBs. Something important to check when assembling switches into the PCB and plate is to make sure that your switch is fully seated against the PCB. So the switch should be as close to the PCB as physically possible. Some switches are looser so they won't require a lot of force to push in, but some will require stonk finger power in order to get them to sit flat. A great way to check your switches are seated properly is to check the side profile of your build and inspect how close your switch is from the PCB. Switches have tiny, tiny nubs on the bottom of them, so there will be a slight gap, but they should be sitting very flush against the PCB. Now, stabilizers. To the best of my knowledge, Cherry or GMK stabs have extra nubs on the stems that are typically clipped, while Zeal, Duroc, C3, OA, etc. stabs do not. I used to only clip off the perpendicular protrusion of the extra piece until I watched some videos where people were clipping off the entire piece, and since I've never really tested which is better or worse, I kind of aim towards the middle now. When disassembling and reassembling stabilizers, I use the two-hole to one-hole method. The stabilizer the stem has two holes on one side and one hole on the other. The stabilizer housing has one hole on one side and no hole on the other. So you line up the two holes on the stem to the one hole of the housing. And then the wire goes into the bottom hole of the stem. Double check that the housings are clipped on in the same direction. Sometimes when I'm being absent-minded during the build, I'll accidentally clip them on rotated and you can't really install them if they're like that. It's very easy to fix though. There are two different types of mounting methods for stabs. Kind of. So there are plate mount stabilizers, which have little ridges on the side of the stabilizers that should align with the cutouts of the plate. Similar to how you can check the alignment with JST connectors, you can do the same with the plate mount stabs. For PCB mount stabs, there are cutouts on the PCB where you slide the stabilizer feet into, and you slide the bigger protruding part of the stab into the bigger hole. The smaller hole is usually where the screw or the clip goes. If you're using screw and stabilizers, here is where you can place a washer if you're including that in your build. If you're using clip-in stabs, just press the clips in so that they're sitting firmly into the PCB. If you need to remove your clip-ins, I like to use sharp tweezers to apply pressure and pop them right out. You can also apply a little piece of tape or band-aid to do the band-aid mod and soften out the bottom out sound of your stabilizers. Now is the fun part, soldering. For me, soldering is now the most straightforward and enjoyable part of a build, but it's definitely daunting at first. I solder with 0.8 millimeter solder at 320 degrees Celsius. I found that the best way for me to solder is to align my soldering tip flat against the back of the switch pin and push the solder on the front of the switch pin. The solder should flow around the front to the back and create a nice little TP shape. If there are any gaps in the TP, I'll swipe my soldering iron quickly around to balance out the solder. I'm sure there are many other methods for soldering and it's not exclusive to just the keyboard hobby, so if you're struggling with this part, I highly recommend watching other videos. I think what really helps with soldering is getting familiar with the speed at which your solder melts so that you can evenly feed the solder into the iron. If you're doing a three pin plateless build, then the easiest way to make sure your switches are properly aligned is to use keycaps, soldering one leg in, adjusting the alignment if you need to, and then soldering the other leg in. I pray for all souls who need to desolder, but if you're rebuilding a board or if you have a switch with a flattened pin and didn't realize until you soldered one pin in, good luck and you can do it!
I will either use the Engineer SS02 hand pump or my desoldering gun. This is probably the most tricky part of a typical keyboard build if you're using a hand pump. And it definitely took me a while to figure out how to use the desoldering pump correctly. First off, I like to trim the rubber nozzle so that it's at an angle. It's easier to work with this way because when I'm handling the pump, it's usually at an angle. If the nozzle is cut to fit the angle, then it works more naturally with how my hand is already angled. The most important thing to try to do while desoldering with this pump is to create a seal around the switch pin and solder so that when you activate the sucking mechanism, all of the solder is removed. When you touch your iron to the pin, the solder will start to melt and once it's melted all the way through, the texture and look changes a bit. It also starts bubbling. I actually prefer to touch my soldering iron to the bottom side of the pin or the side closer to me when I'm desoldering, unlike the top side of the pin when I'm soldering. Once your solder is fully melted, place your desoldering pump against the pin, create a seal, and activate the sucking mechanism. If all of the solder was removed, you should be able to see through the pinhole to see the bottom of the switch. If the solder was not removed cleanly, you can try reflowing the pin by adding some more solder and then trying the whole process over again. Sometimes the switch pin is attached to the edge of the pinhole because the pin is a little bent, so I use my soldering iron to straighten out the pin. With a duck gun, the process is much easier since the seal to melt the solder is created automatically and you don't have to wear out your hand handling the manual pump. It's really important to make sure you remove all or basically 99% of the solder because if you don't, it gets really difficult to remove your switches and you also open up the possibility for ripping your trace. You shouldn't be applying more force than usual when removing your desoldered switches. With desoldering, patience is key. Obviously, none of these steps are very in-depth explanations to keep this video as concise as possible, but I hope it was able to demystify at least a little of the keyboard building process. There are a lot more complex things that you may run into while building boards, such as um, missing SMD components, dealing with broken trace, but hopefully these are all the steps that you'll run into in a typical build. There are also a lot of really amazing tutorial videos out there on switch modding, stab modding, any sort of soldering, desoldering. I would definitely go check those videos out. Of course, you're free to stop by my stream anytime. I stream twice a week at twitch.tv slash Minchili and I will very happily go over any questions that you may have as long as I have an answer to them. <laughs> I do pretty much go through all of these steps with every keyboard build that I do, so yeah, feel free to always come hang out. That's all I got this time. Thank you so much for watching. Please, please take care and hope to see you next time.